Morning everybody, uh, welcome to Caesar's Palace. I never get tired of saying welcome to Caesar's Palace. It's, a, it's almost as if I'm the Rat Pack moved on. Um, I've been asked to open up the session on digital cinema um, with an update. Um, I'm also an account that actually would like to not talk about digital cinema. I've been doing it for nine, eight or nine years now, uh, presentations like this. And while I enjoy it and love it and get very passionate about talking about it, there is a point at which you say, all right, we really need to talk about cinema again. And that point, I think, is quite soon. So to start off with, um, the inevitable bar chart. And the bar chart this time shows you the progress of digital cinema around the world at the end of 2012. Now, as you can see, there are around about 125, 130 screens in the world. And um, of that, the majority are digital. Um, about two and a half years ago, I predicted the date for a digital majority of cinemas and I said it would be January the 11th 2012 in the morning and um, come December the 27th, two weeks before, there was a digital cinema majority so I was off by two weeks and it's my eternal shame I have to live with that, it's my cross I have to bear, um, I'll manage, I'm, I'm coping, the therapy does wonders. So you have mainly D cinema, the first two bars, um, the grey and the dark blue. And you can see that that's about 72% um, of the world um, is the cinema. You also have e-cinema. Uh, e-cinema is not often mentioned because there are only two pockets of the world that has it. Um, there's 5,500 e-cinema screens in India. So between those two, you have about 78% of the world's cinema screens converted to digital. So we're over three quarters of the way there. Um, as you can see, 35mm is still around. There's still 30,000 or so 35mm screens. It's digitised. Uh, as Tony uh, said this morning, he's not sure where they are, uh, or what they are, what sort of screens they are. It could be small screens for the S2K, it could be larger screens, it could be screens just uh, waiting to convert for the best price, it could be screens who have no idea how they're going to convert. Um, we don't know who they are maybe, but we know where they are. And actually part of the theme of this morning is to explain where they are, and why they are where they are. Does that make sense at all? <laughs> if it does to you, then you're a better man than me. So just by region, we split it down, um, Asia, North America, Europe, and other. Um, it's not meant to be dismissive other, it's just it's a smaller category, and there's lots of them. So Europe, you see pretty good growth from the past two years. Um, America, you see much earlier growth, and Asia, you see pretty good growth for the past two years. So already a, a picture is building that the past 24 months has been the critical period in digital cinema. Before that, we talked about it a lot. And we had 3D, and 3D started the conversion process. It's not a rollout, 3D, because there's a different financial rationale behind it. But 3D sort of gave it momentum, and then 2D took over. So a 2D rollout is now in full swing in Asia, in Europe, uh, North America has been, um, and other parts of the world as well. Um, some part, parts of uh, Eastern Europe, and one country, or two, one, yeah, one country in Latin America. So, pretty good growth. Overall, first quarter, just gone, so uh, two or two, three weeks ago. We've got about 94,000 D screens in the world. So 94,000 out of 129 um, are digitised. To D cinema standard. <coughs> but where are they? Here you cry. Um, they're there. They are, well, you can see very clearly that in North America, we, we know that that's the most advanced part of the world. And with 86.5%, now Canada's finished. And Canada's done its rollout, it's converted. Uh, USA, it was very fast up to a certain point, up to about 85, 80%. And the past, the last 15% has taken a bit of a time to convert, to try and find that the viability of a, a model for the, essentially, the smaller cinemas. Um, but 86.5 is, yeah, it's almost, it's almost done. Western Europe as well, you can see 76.8, so over three quarters of screens in Western Europe are digital. Um, some countries have done it, um, well, I'll, go, I'll go through this in a minute actually, but you know, there's been a mix of approaches to this, public money, private money, um, investment uh, through VPF, uh, through integrators, um, but all in all, the Western European rollout, past 24 months has been extremely, extremely fast. Same with most of Asia. Um, parts of Asia are finished, you know, the Chinese market is over 93% done, Indonesia is finished, uh, Japan's very highly digitised as well, so there's parts of Asia which are extremely advanced, Singapore, Hong Kong as well. Um, so, large countries, smaller countries, um, they've been finishing. Uh, there are some pockets of Asia left, um, Thailand, Turkey, Malaysia, that haven't actually got as far as that, um, but they are in a minority. 
Eastern Europe, also pretty well done, but Eastern Europe has a, a specific peculiarities of the market characteristics which links it to uh, its sort of Soviet past, in which public ownership, public cinemas, small sort of village town cinemas, um, still exist in great numbers, and they're finding it actually difficult to convert. So where you have circuits in Eastern Europe, they're converting pretty easily, but smaller, independent, single-screen cinemas in small towns in Poland, Czech Republic, um, you know, necessarily, isn't necessarily a model for them. As it stands, public money has come in to fill that gap. So those are the ones really that um, are more advanced. Um, so the two that we can see quite clearly aren't more advanced are Africa, Middle East, apart from the UAE, um, which is done, and Latin America. Now, Africa, Middle East, parts of Africa don't have cinemas, and if they do, they're not necessarily the cinemas that we sort of have in our minds. Um, South Africa, Morocco, Egypt, they have cinemas, and some of them have been converted, some aren't. Um, Arts Alliance, for example, has converted to Turkey and and South Africa. Latin America really is the area um, I've been focusing on the past few months myself. I won't go into too much detail here, but it's the market really where there is no, at the moment, there's a lot of movement around, a lot of people that want to do it, but there's no concrete VPF model on the table in most countries. Um, the, ma the market's characterised by one a large exhibitor, one or two large exhibitors, and lots of smaller ones. And this, uh, this market is actually proving very difficult to convert. So, we look at cinema formats. Now, I know cinema formats is quite an odd way of, of putting it, um, but that's how I sort of see now. There's three cinema formats in, in each country, in each region. 35mm, 2D, 3D. You know, 35mm, obviously, if the market is majority 35mm, it's not converted. If the market is majority 3D, it's done a 3D conversion, but it's struggling for a 2D conversion, i.e. the full rollout. If a market for 2D is majority, essentially it's a market that's in full swing. So look at the regions we just looked at on the map. You can see again that um, the, the blue bars are digital, whether it's 2D or 3D. So a lot of blue bars equals highly digitised. North America, Western Europe, Asia, highly digitised. Yeah, the grey bar is 35 mil, so on some of those you have very little, small amounts of grey. But you know, uh, Latin America, Africa, uh, Asia, e sorry, Asia Pac and um, Eastern Europe have still a third of 35 mil. So still significant numbers of screens of 35 mil to be done. And if we drill down a little bit more, um, so go from regional to the territorial, let's look at some territories within those regions. And if we look at Latin America, Central Latin America, so Mexico on its own, so you have three large cinema chains in Mexico, very large cinema chains in Mexico, they are converting, they've announced the conversion, and they're getting pretty fast. So you can see a lot of blue, 2D, 3D, and the, the, the light blue, the 2D blue, is increasing uh, in the past probably three to four months um, as that rollout starts. But if you look at all the others, um, all you can really see is the 3D bar. So all those other countries, um, apart from Colombia, I'll come back to that in a sec, uh, 3D. So essentially those markets are digital to the extent that they can show 3D and other stuff, but the actual rollout, the model, the VPF, the whatever model has been used, is not yet in place. And that sort of highlighted part of it just shows you that really that, that's what's driving that market still. Um, and that's actually common to Eastern Europe as well. Colombia, slightly different in that uh, there is one major circuit, Cineco, Cine Colombia, and they've signed a deal to convert and they are sort of getting on with it. So at that point, you know, they own, I don't know, 50, 60% of the market, and they, they're going. And that sort of highlights a point that you can actually get very high numbers sometimes of the market being digitised with only one signature on a, on a piece of paper. You know, one, one circuit goes, they get very high numbers, and it stops, because everyone else doesn't quite know what to do. I was in Colombia about four months ago talking about this, and that's essentially you know, the situation they have. You know, one circuit's gone, the rest are sort of going, well, what do we do? Um, and it's, you know, it's a question I can never answer, to be honest. But, look at Western Europe, we have a totally different um, set of conditions. Uh, the first most striking thing about this, I think, is that how many have finished? Look at the ones where there's no grey at all. There's no grey bar, so there's no 35 mil in, let's go through them, Belgium, Denmark, nearly France, uh, Luxembourg, Netherlands, uh, Sweden this year actually, UK pretty much done, uh, Iceland not quite, but Norway and Switzerland. So, those countries are converted. There is no more 35mm in those countries. They've gone. They've gone using a mixture of public money, private money, VPF, self-finance, 3D to start off with as well. Publicly organised uh, schemes. So the Netherlands, Norway had a situation, had a uh, position where the public agencies came in and organised a rollout. In Norway it was for the whole market, so the whole market rolled out in one go. In Netherlands it was for a part of the market, but the 
government came in, provided some money, not a lot, some, but between 10 and 15 percent, but essentially organised it, took control. And that's actually what I'm seeing. When you see successful conversions around the world, what you actually see behind it quite often is, is a, a figurehead, someone, someone who takes control and says, OK, look, we'll, just, we'll, we'll set this up. So you see the same in the private sector. You see private collaborations between exhibitors. You've seen it in the States. You've seen it in Canada, Australia, uh, Korea, and Japan. You see it quite often where exhibitors come together, put aside differences, and um, say, OK, we're going to take control of this and do it. And those are the countries that are digitised. The ones that don't do that, and the ones that sort of do it piecemeal, or you know, the government agency doesn't really get their head around it, they're the ones that are struggling. And on that map, uh, well, not maps, are on the chart, you know, the ones I've highlighted, um, Greece, Ireland, and Spain. Now, Greece, Ireland, and Spain, sorry, Greece, Italy, and Spain, are, um, I was going to say, three of the largest markets in, uh, in Europe, but Ireland isn't. Greece, Italy, Germany, Italy, and Spain are three of the largest markets in Europe, and they're, well, certainly Italy and Spain are struggling to digitise. No one's taking control. The government agencies haven't. Um, some of the larger exhibitors are doing their own thing. But essentially, you know, outside the large exhibitors in every market, there are a lot of smaller exhibitors. Now, what's happened in the UK is a very good example of how you can do this as a private sector initiative. You take uh, a group of smaller, not, not single screens autom uh, automatically, smaller exhibitors, smaller circuits maybe, 25, 30 screens, single screens as well, and you bring them together in a group. This has happened as, as well around the world, Australia has this as well, where the smaller guys, who essentially no one was sort of saying to them, you know, we're rushing to get your signature, they would organise themselves and become a more interesting proposition. We had this uh, just, just, uh, two years ago, wasn't it? I think I moderated a, a panel on this, on uh, funding groups. And that's just taking, you know, taking routes throughout the world, actually. And a lot of the territories that have digitised have used that model. If we take Asia Pacific, um, we see a similar thing. You see some markets where there's no grey, no grey at all. So 35 mil, that's gone. Um, South Korea, Singapore, South Korea, it was a, the largest exhibitors came together and organised a rollout, and then that actually, they, they spread that out themselves to the smaller exhibitors. So that was, again, private initiative taking, taking control. Singapore was, um, it's private, VPF funded. Um, Japan, group of exhibitors again came together, rolled out. Hong Kong wasn't, it was just VPF um, sort of, you know, uh, offering to cinema exhibitors, and they took it. And the markets which are struggling, Thailand, Turkey. Now Thailand, Turkey, again, no one's taking control. Thailand has two major exhibitors, and they have, to a certain extent, digitised. Um, but it's the guys outside of that that's often the problem. And those are the ones you know, which we need to address. There's 30,000 screens on them around the world. So it's not, a, it's not an insignificant problem. We don't want to lose 10-15% you know, of our box office. So, which one's that? The race to the D finish, yes. So those territories there, the ones that are at the top, 100%. So those are the countries that are done, they're finished. And this chart starts at 90%. So everyone on that chart is 90% or plus digitised. So really those are the ones that are going to go this year. And if you look at those countries, there's some very big countries on there. China, UK, <coughs> and France as well. You know, there's some countries that would probably, if you added all up, um, would equal... 30% 35% of the world screens that will finish this year. The converse, countries lagging behind. Now of those countries, some have a solution, some just haven't done it yet. So South Africa hasn't necessarily started its full rollout, even though there is a you know, one leading exhibitor that is doing the rollout. But some of the other countries, especially see the Latin American countries, don't have that solution in place yet. They might have quite soon. Um, they haven't got that long to do it. And you, know, you think about Latin America, including Mexico, about 10, 11,000 screens. It's a significant block of screens. It's not a block you want to lose. Um, Eastern, Europe, uh, Eastern Europe appears in there as well. But you know, that shows you that while there's some small countries on there, and once it's on 0.05% of screens, still a country's cinema sector is struggling to convert. And those are the sort of areas that really we need to sort of, people need to start addressing, putting their brains to now and saying, okay, well, how do we do this? What do we do about these people? And those are the 35 mil screens left to convert. So those are the, the larger markets, excluding the USA and India, um, which I haven't included because they're too, it's too big. They ruin the chart, basically. You want purity in the chart, don't you? So those are the ones who are left to convert. Again, of those, you have some, like Mexico, which will convert. They have a solution in place, um, South Africa. But there are some there, you know, 1,000, 1,500 screens, um, not necessarily 
have a solution in place. Those are big blocks of screens. So that's the general uh, position of digital. That's the sort of, uh, hopefully, giving you an idea of global down to territorial. So there's parts of the world doing well, parts not so well. A quick look at 3D. I mean, 3D is, well, it's there, obviously. It's about half of the world's uh, digital screens are 3D. So I think we're currently at about 45,000 3D screens in the world. But what's most noticeable on that chart, to me anyway, is the sort of uh, the darker blue line. That's the international 3D screen line. So yes, 3D screens make up half of the world's digital screens, but actually growth has been in international. That might seem logical. You know, the international market was probably two years behind North American. So what we're seeing with the North American, which gives a good insight into what happened internationally, you know, a maturing market. And you know, 3D was something that we never thought it was going to be 100% 3D, and we never thought it was going to be a fad either. Um, it's something that is there, and it's part of the market. It's generally about 20% of most box office markets is, is 3D, in between 20 and 25%. So that's actually stabilising now. So we've seen a position, we, we sort of, you read things sometimes saying, oh, 3D's you know, gone, it's off. It hasn't gone, it's not off, it's just, it's, it's maturing. It's not a novelty anymore. You have 45,000 3D screens around the world, you have quite a lot of choice of 3D screens to go and see something in. You have a fair amount of content, about 40 films a year, mostly studio content, 95% of revenues is studio content, so it's still driven by the studios. There is local content out there, but it's not in any way sort of dominating. Um, you have a different ranges, different approaches in countries, and different exhibitors have different approaches to 3D. Some have 25% of their screens, some have 80%. Overall, it's about 50%. Um, China is 70%, so China has a very, very positive attitude to 3D. And in fact, recently they uh, relaxed their relatively tight legis legislation to allow 14 more foreign films in, you know, for foreign US films. And those films had to be in 3D or anim animated. So those films are being specifically brought into the market because the demand was there. So 3D is there, and 3D is you know, it's a very useful part of what we do. It's a subsector of the box office. And it's it's, it's not, sort of nothing more, nothing less, really. But it is extremely useful in driving people to the cinema. That's the cinema, though. Um, what's happening outside the cinema for 3D is not quite as encouraging. Or it, actually, there's good and bad. It could be encouraging or not. The good is that cinema is still the place to watch 3D. It's still the best place to watch a film anyway, but it's still the place to watch 3D. And 94% of revenues last year, came, 3D revenues, came from the cinema. But I feel that you actually you probably will, will need to expand 3D out. It needs to be other media that take 3D and it, it, it thrives on other media outside of gaming, which is doing okay. You know, 6% is encouraging, and it's a start, so other media are sort of seeing it. But 3D TV hasn't taken off as people hoped. It might still do. I think possibly the forecasts are a bit optimistic. Um, and Blu ray 3D, things like that. You know, but we need to have an overall business model for 3D that actually addresses you know, reinvestment. If it's just cinema that's providing revenue for 3D, then effectively you have a static market. There's no growth in that market. So we need to bring in other media so the, the overall pool of money to reinvest in 3D goes up. So I think you know, it's good and bad for the moment. Benefit from it. It's the best place to watch 3D is in the cinema. But longer term, I think people you know, need, we need to look at developing models that bring in other media. I wanted to touch on this area um, because this is all about what we're talking about now. It's about digital. It's not just about converting screens. It's about other things. Phase two of digital was always about getting movies to the cinema in digital, satellite or fibre. And in the States, we're seeing you know, pretty um, good progress of a DCDC, for example, a satellite venture. Um, excuse me. But what we have seen with satellite, I feel about five years ago, industry assumption was that satellite was the way to deliver movies. And it is a, a way to deliver movies, it's a good way in the right context. But then you, know, you have other ways to do it as well, and fibre is one of them. And in the past two or three years, we're actually seeing more, more and more people take notice of fibre. I mean, for a start, it's something that governments in some countries have invested a lot of money in. There's parts of Asia, um, but Singapore, you know, places like Korea, broadband has been a, a focus of government investment. You know, very strong telecommunications companies and very strong sort of, um, investment strategies by government. So if the infrastructure's there, why not look at using it? And people are. Um, in Europe, uh, Norway and the Netherlands, for example, have built, you know, have now fibre-based movie delivery systems. The Norwegian system is interesting. Um, it's, again, based on a single model. Every cinema has signed up to it. I think 97% of cinemas signed up to it. And it is, um, it's called Movie Transit. It's done by Unique Digital, and it's a system that moves films around based on, you know, on demand, so distributed demand. But, again, the interesting part for me is the fact that it's been done as a single market approach. 
Now that's a publicly organised one, by a private company, but organised by the public. But more and more I think about this and talk to people, the more I'm seeing that actually it's not necessarily a good thing to have too much competition in this sector, because it requires a lot of investment to do. And if you start trying to build your own broadband network to every cinema in your country, it's going to cost a lot of money. And quite frankly, I'm not sure the return's going to be there to, to, to make it back. So you have to pick it back on someone else's broadband network. Um, satellites are different because the satellites are there, so you can use existing satellites. But what's happening is that you know, the demand from studios and other distributors is pushing down the costs of hard drives. Hard drives in quite a lot of countries are still the, the dominant way of getting movies to cinemas. And as the price points are coming down and there's a demand to get them down further, 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 and the, the, the big labs and the smaller labs are coming up with ways to do that, it brings down the whole price point for everyone else as well. So if the studio say we want it to be X dollars, you know, everyone else has got to match that. Because this is about economics. It's not about you know, charity, is it? So hard drives are actually being entrenched in the system, I think, now, um, because of the price points they can deliver. Now, this might change. I think the, the, sort of the point where it might become different is the, the VPF ending. At that point, distributor savings that have been promised, uh, they're locked in now with VPFs. But at that point, they'll become open again. There'll be no more VPF to pay, so there's more money around, theoretically, to invest in other stuff. But I think the, my point generally is that you, know, it, you have to be careful how we do this rollout of distribution. Um, it is going to be a, a hybrid network around the world. It's going to be a whole different system, set of systems. One country satellite, one country both, one country hard drive, whatever. And everyone's got to work with that. Um, but I think we just have to be careful what we wish for in this, in this sense. Just some numbers there. Uh, that's the European infrastructure of equipped DCP delivery cinemas. So uh, there's about 1,000, I think, um, around Europe. And half of those, no, more than that, sorry, it's about 2,500, half of those are in France. Um, so French market, you can see the grey bar, it's actually very, very advanced in terms of equipped um, cinemas for satellite or fibre delivery. Some not so advanced. Um, in general, about I think about 17% of cinemas are equipped. So it's still early days, and still actually you can't say one way or the other. Yes, it's going to be this or this or this. And we're still it's still evolving. People's models are still evolving, and also cinemas are still evolving how they do it. I'll just skip the one. All right. So last couple of slides. This all brings us to, I think, what probably is going to be the theme of the whole cinema con, actually, is that technology is around us, you know, from a technology-free zone. Ten years ago, we had a technology-rich zone, somewhere where the technology comes together, consumer technology, industrial technology. It's coming together in a place where you can use stuff, and you can choose stuff, you can choose this, that, and the other. There's a whole palette of different options you can choose from technology. Now, the top part of this is more production-led. Um, yeah, production is also moving to digital as well, which has an impact on the whole workflow. But the bottom three here, high frame rates, laser, 3D or immersive sound. Those are the things we're going to hear a lot about this week, yeah, a, lot, a lot about in the next couple of years as well. Um, but it just it highlights, I think, that yeah, the nature of what we're doing here, of digitising cinemas, is not actually about digitising cinemas, it's about moving cinema on. And actually, once we start doing that, then these things become available as tools to use. And basically, yes, that's highlighted. Well done, David. And... <laughs> The next one, pretty much my penultimate slide, the last one's three words, so don't worry. This is my timeline for 35mm, and I did this again a couple of years ago. Um, do you like the way I make predictions and tell you about them when I got them right? Uh, I won't tell you the ones about I got wrong, right? I'll just tell you the ones I made I got right. Um, this is a timeline for 35mm end of, basically. And you can see quite clearly that yeah, if there's no 35mm in the country, there's no need for 35mm. That's, that's clear. So some countries are finished already. But overall, I think that you know, by the end of 2015 there'll be no cinemas left in the world mainstream using 35mm. I might finish sooner, frankly, uh, if 35mm becomes so unviable no one can use it. And that yeah, might actually be the case. But in general, I think we have about another probably 18, 20 months of 35mm as a medium to use before everything's digital. And as I said, that part is when Really, we can just say, right, we're now digital, okay? We, have, we, we are cinema again. We can actually talk about cinema again. Phil's plea, you know? We don't have to say digital cinema, because we are all digital. It doesn't, there's no differentiation, it's meaningless. Everyone's digital, there's no digital cinema. We're back to cinema. And at that point, I think that that becomes interesting, because then you can start using this stuff, you know, using it to differentiate with other media, using it to, to create new things for, for customers, using it to make um, new content. All these things is what top technology is about. It's not about technology for its own sake, it's to do something with it. So I think in conclusion, I think, my conclusion would be, 
Well, so firstly, we're going to see a lot more blokes with beards in the future at Cinemarcon. And secondly, the future is just beginning. Thank you.